my wonderful job to welcome you. Um, you have to excuse my voice. I come to you from uh, right off the plane. I came home late last night from Florida, and on my way to Miami, the lady sitting next to me decided to give me a gift, and that was the gift of a cold, and I had it in Florida, and I brought it back here, and I'm not planning on giving it to any of you. Um, I, just so that you know, as an aside, Miami was full of New Yorkers. They said that the hotels were sold out, that many of the New Yorkers came down to Florida, which I've always called the South Bronx. I was born in the Bronx and moved to Miami as a young child, and people would say, where are you from? And I would say the South Bronx, which was Miami Beach. And um, right now, the hotels are full, there are no cars to rent, and uh, Miami Beach is rocking and rolling. Boy, has it changed over the years, I have to tell you. It's really a vacation playground. That is not a uh, publicity for, the, for them. Um, I want to sincerely thank Cal Gross and Jonah Goldrich, who have been friends and supporters of mine and of Sherry Aesthetics for a long, long time. Um, I actually, Eleanor just asked me if this is my natural color hair. I think they supported me when it was my natural color hair, so uh, I've known them. And also Hal Foonberg as well. Um, but Jonah and Cal are, uh, are hosting this breakfast, so I thank them especially and welcome you all. I'm sorry that a few others who did RSVP aren't here. You know, um, we all know that Israel is always first to help out. And this terrible disaster that has happened in New York and in the East and I heard this morning on the news that there are still possibly 120,000 people without electricity in, in that area. And something that we didn't see on the news, um, because of course it's something that Israel did for the good, but that a friend did send me while I was in Florida, and I thought I would share it with you. Aid for Sandy Victims from Israel. It, this was on Google. Um, it was reported November 4, 2012. Israel Flying Aid, the Israeli Global Humanitarian Organization, was, uh, has landed, uh, um, the, the ones who landed also in Haiti following the 2010 earthquake, has been distributing large supplies of gas to hospitals, food, batteries, and generators to Hurricane Sandy victims. We have many years of disaster relief experience at Israel Flying Aid, North American Operations Manager Moti Kahani, Israel Flying Aid, in having Israelis on the ground here in New York and in Jersey, have made Israel the only foreign nation to provide humanitarian assistance to the U.S. during this disaster. We are working in coordination with FEMA, local police, the American Red Cross, and Jewish communities in New York, in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We are also very proud to see you, to welcome you to New York, said Dr. Jason Mallon, who normally practices neurology at North Shore University Hospital, <coughs> but was now volunteering with the Nassau County Department of Health. We read about Israel and the great work you did in Haiti. So he says, we have thousands here that need you. It's awesome that you are here. And the article finishes, it's a, a long article, it says, as Israelis, we know how to react to such disasters, said Kahana. We are trained in the military to be prepared and ready at a moment's notice. This edge is what enables us to go places where others don't and get the job done with little or no bureaucracy. We are proud to help New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut communities, people who have provided assistance to Israel throughout the years. That's our Israel, and in that vein, I'm going to ask Cal Gross, one of this morning's co-chairs, to officially introduce and welcome Dr. Ofer Marin, Sherrod Zedek, Deputy Director General, and a real hero in our time. So thank you again for coming. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Jonah and I appreciate uh, your interest, and uh, I'm sure Shelley and Paul and Ofer appreciate it as well. And thank you very much for flying in from a very difficult schedule, I'm sure that you have. Uh, 
I'm very pleased to introduce our guest of the, the, the morning. Uh, Dr. Ofer Mara is Deputy Director General of Shara Zedek Hospital in Jerusalem, and he's also Director of Shara Zedek's Emergency Preparedness and Response Unit. And he was born and raised in Jerusalem, Israel, and from 1979 to 1983, served in the paratroopers unit of the Israel Defense Forces. Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. Today he holds the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and Chief of uh, the IDF Field Hospitals. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel McMahon was one of the senior leaders of the IDF Medical Corps operation in Haiti and Japan and was honored by doctors of the USC Medical Center who also worked in Haiti for his efforts in assistance. And as you remember, they had a, a mobile hospital unit that traveled from Israel to Haiti. And I think you were first on the ground, as I recollect. Right there. And, uh, that's it. That's it right there. And did amazing, amazing things. He received his uh, medical degree from Hadassah Hebrew University Medical School. And from 1992 to 2000, served as a cardiothoracic surgery resident at Cherizetic, followed by a clinical fellowship in cardi cardiac surgery at Sunnybrook and Women's Health Center in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Merrin currently serves as the Deputy Director General, as I have mentioned, at Cherizetic, and he's Director of the Cherizetic's emergency, emergency Preparedness and Response Unit, Head of the Trauma Unit, and as a staff member in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. He's a member of the Israeli Medical Association, the Israel Heart Society, and the Israel Cardiothoracic Society, and serves as a lecturer in cardiothoracic surgery at Hadassah Medical School and Ben-Gurion University Medical School. And he and his wife, Ora, live in Navasarat, is that correct? Yes, Zion yes, with their four children. Now, have I left anything out? No. No. I, 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 let me uh, continue by having him proceed from here. Thank you very much. Okay. So, what have you done recently? Hey. <laughs> okay. So, um, that's not my same. Um, although it's a presentation with slides and everything, it's nothing is formal. We're a small group, so just interrupt me whenever you want to ask anything. And there's food, and really just step back and take more food. It's fine. It's not a lecture that I have to give. Um, so, when you're speaking about a hospital, you can you can speak about numerous things. Uh, and I decided in my, I don't know, 20 minutes presentation to speak about uh, something that, um, first of all, is close to my uh, heart and uh, things that I uh, invest a lot of my personal uh, time. And uh, unfortunately, in the States also is, a, is an issue lately. Um, lately, not only what happened two weeks ago, but I guess uh, at least in the last 10 years, uh, people are speaking about preparedness to mass casualty events. So I would like to share with you a little bit about the preparedness of Israel to mass casualty events, and then I'll speak specifically about Sharet Tzedek, what, at least in my eyes, I think we are we're doing special in the Sharet Tzedek to prepare for that. And again, you know, I can probably speak for hours about the hospital and the different um, centers of excellence that we have in Sharet Tzedek, but I pick to concentrate on one thing and I'll be happy to speak about uh, other things. So you can always ask if anyone is really pre prepared for mass casualty events. Uh, uh, Sandy happened two weeks ago and people are already in the media now asking who yeah. was, was the uh, states pre prepared or not. Haiti in 2010, the earthquake, Japan, this huge economy. Um, that is trying to prepare itself to tsunamis and uh, earthquakes and so on. So when you're speaking about emergency, uh, 
management of these usually forward phases, the prevention, which is which is sometimes an issue. People say for natural disasters, there's no way to prevent. It's true, but you know, again, in the media you can hear now people are saying maybe they should put walls around Manhattan and so on. There is way at least to mitigate the damage for mass casualty events. A lot has been spoken about the preparation. You know, natural the disasters are happening. There was an earthquake in Guatemala this morning. There's every week, there's somewhere around the world, there is some mass casualty uh, event. And uh, there's no question. If you prepare better, then, uh, then there's, no, there's no question that the damage is, is going to be less. And how to respond when the event happens? Uh, and the recovery phase, we're going to speak about that. So what does Israel have to prepare for? So anything that you can see here from the toxi toxicological and chemical events, mass casualty events, biological events, natural disasters, radiological events, numerous different uh, things. Israel has a natural frame of mind to be prepared for this mass casualty events. Part of it is because, unfortunately, we are in a constant state of war in uh, Israel. So there is high levels of preparedness, both public and civil. Uh, a lot of emphasis is put in Israel about uh, training, I think, much more than most of the rest of the countries. Um, so I think chaos is maybe the main characteristic of any mass Events. I will show you really a very short uh, video. Uh, uh, this is about uh, uh, one minute, minute away from Charlotte. Uh, uh, I will show the whole video. But just a little bit of understanding. This is taking uh, five minutes after the explosion of uh, this bus. So just a little bit of understanding how to keep up. So mass casualty events all over Israel, uh, just in the last 10 years, uh, more than 200 mass casualty events all around Israel. So Israel has to be on constant uh, alert for these. Uh, and the question is, if you can try to build a generic approach to all of these um, different um, events that, that can happen. Um, and and maybe the most important thing when you're speaking about the health system is to be able to have a, a, a surge capacity. Because when a disaster happens, God forbid, in LA or in New York or in Israel, then within minutes, the hospitals have to take care of hundreds of thousands more people. So the surge the capacity is maybe the most important thing. And Israel does a lot in order to in, in, enhance this uh, capacity. The resources are coordinated on a national base. This is, again, different than what is happening in the States. Every hospital has established goal. If the hospital has 1,000 beds, you should be prepared to get 200 patients within a short while. So every hospital has its own goal. And you have to prepare and show that you are ready to get within minutes, let's say 200 new uh, patients, and there are uh, <coughs> what is called a national checklist in each one of the hospitals, a follow-up system of responsible leader. Every hospital, like what I'm doing in Charlotte, but every hospital has a person which is responsible for these uh, events. The surge cap capacity in Israel is coordinated on a national base. There is a place in Israel that we report every day what is the capacity of the hospital now? So you know now how many patients are ventilated in Israel. You know that this is the number of ventilators that we have all, all around Israel, and these are the numbers that are how many intensive care beds are occupied in Israel, and uh, so on. The issue of expanding the facility of having power lines, of being able to treat patients in the corridor, again, is something that we are putting attention in. Protocol to clear the emergency de departments. If, again, if there's a mass casualty event that 100 wounded people are walking in, the emergency room, like I guess in all or most of the hospitals in A, is full. So you can't just bring within 10 minutes 100 wounded people. 
the protocols, how to evacuate the emergency room within a short time. And again, these are things that we continue to drill. People, every person in the hospital knows what's his position in mass casualty events. Some people think, okay, there is a mass casualty event, we should all go down to the emergency room to treat people. This, of course, is wrong. You need to keep physicians and nurses in the ward to continue to treat the patients. You have different sites in the hospital, so every person knows his designated area in the hospital. We have designated sites for treatment of these um, people. And the EMS su supervisor on scene have a way how to triage the patients into different hospitals, in which each one of the hospitals there is a representative of the emergency systems that can report to the site how many patients we have already and so on. So we have annual full scale uh, casualty uh, drills. The equipment, these national stock piles of uh, uh, life saving uh, equipment that in case of uh, event can be spread around through the <coughs> hospitals and so on. Uh, Again, a lot of uh, time is invested into uh, training. There's a national web-based database. So if there is an event in Jerusalem and wounded people are spread between the hospital, we all put the information of the wounded people into one uh, website system. It's called the Adam system. So if you, in each one of the hospitals, if a family is coming to look, searching for one of the beloved ones. They don't have to go from a hospital to hospital. We have in our hospital, we can see the photos and the information about patients that are in other hospitals. This is one system that is for all of the hospitals. So again, we are doing a annual a full scale drills. Some of these drills are just for the hospital, but a lot of them are uh, either nationally we had a big earthquake drill all over Israel about three weeks ago, and sometimes I'll show you the mass casualty yeah, event yeah, station yeah, is yeah, used yeah, by yeah, MDA yeah, and yeah, volunteer yeah, medical crews yeah, for treating yeah, casualties. Yeah, yeah. Bystanders who are able to assist the medical teams. Yeah, yeah. The chain of command at the scene is as follows. The police take charge of the site. Rescue commanders, including the IDF, join forces to assess the situation and plan the response. So look, this drill really uh, Immediate care category casualties receive necessary care, such as ensuring airway, immobilizing cervical spine, adequate ventilation, and controlling hemorrhage, and are rapidly evacuated to the appropriate hospital. So Israel is preparing itself to, to mass casualty events, and I think some of this preparedness has been shown, as was mentioned, in our humanitarian aid uh, around the world. And I won't speak about it, but really very short words. Uh, after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, Israel was the first field hospital on the ground 80 hours after the earthquake. This is a picture taken. We had our people over there and already set. And this, again, is, is, is related to the, uh, a national, as I said, frame of mind to be prepared to give assistance in Israel or outside uh -huh. in Israel. This is a picture that I took uh, last year in Japan, in the East Coast, uh, in a small village camp called Minami Sanreko, after the tsunami over there. So the tsunami is, is uh, a force that really uh, uh, clears everything there. So 45 countries around the world approach Japan suggesting them that they will give medical assistance. Israel was the only foreign medical team giving the assistance in uh, Japan. This was last year, so this is our uh, clinic in uh, Japan. And just another short picture. This is in Ghana, in Africa. I left Israel last uh, Thursday. I left my house at 9 p.m., about 6 p.m., three hours before I left. I got a phone call from the army that in Ghana, a, a mall, Collapse. This is how the model before, and this is how it looked after. And Israel decided to send a team over there. So I was discussing if to cancel my uh, trip here, but eventually we decided that 
what is mostly needed over there is a rescue, a research and rescue team. And they were sent in Israel, sent a small team over there. They came back home uh, to Israel on yesterday, but they were four days over there, assisting, as you can see here from the picture, uh, taking people under uh, the So to have a effective, a effective preparedness, again, you have to be in a constant alert. Something in the national control and coordination that is done in Israel, at least from my knowledge, is done less here in the States and in the pre plan. So, what I think, at least in my eyes, is uh, especially in the uh, Sharet Tzedek, in the preparedness uh, for mass casualty events in our <coughs> hospital. Um, so, a few things. First, our location. The Sharet Tzedek is centered really in the heart of in Jerusalem. I'm sure all of you have been in, in Jerusalem, so this is the hospital. But you can see all the important facilities of the city around here, really within five or <coughs> less than ten minutes away from the Sharon City. We have um, a special uh, system to register patients for mass casualty events. We are the only hospital in Israel, maybe in the world, that has this system with a barcode registration of the patients. So patients are entering, we just put a barcode strip around their arm, and when they walk around the hospital, the hospital we have readers and we have an exact <coughs> understanding of how many patients are uh, around the hospital. This is of a drill that we did. So 146 patients in this drill were spread around the hospital, but we know exactly which patient is where and so on. Uh, so this system is uh, these days in two places. One is in the uh, IDF Field Hospital, which I ran in the last 10 years, and the other one is in Charlotte City. So it's a very easy and simple system um, that, that we have in our place. We're talking about drills, uh, just an example of the toxicological uh, drill that we did in Charlotte City. The understanding of drill, I mean, I know that the United States drill as well it should stop. Um, I uh, was terminated to be the head of the 
trauma unit in Shari Tzedek a little more than uh, four years ago. So I started running the trauma unit. Uh, and a week after I came into this position, uh, there was a terror attack in the Merkaz Arab, in one of the yeshivas in the Jerusalem where terrorists came in and shot the, um, the kids that were studying. Eight of them were uh, killed and uh, many were wounded. So this 15-year-old kid that comes from Shderot, Shderot is at the south of uh, Israel, one of these really badly hit uh, areas by missiles coming from uh, Gaza. So he's from Shderot, so his parents sent him away to Jerusalem to be far away on these rockets to uh, study over there. So he's getting five gunshot wounds to his body. He lost his conscience, has no blood pressure. He's rushing in into uh, Sharei Tzedek. This is a fit picture of him six months later when he's going back to the yeshiva to the So our facility in Sharet Tzedek in many ways is prepared well for mass casualty events. From, again, we have multiple en entrances. Uh, all the first three floors are underground. So um, it's much more safer in that we have a large shelter, which I will show uh, in a minute, a large uh, ambulance uh, bay. This is the ambulance bay. Uh, this is the shelter of uh, Shari Tzedek, where we keep all the uh, equipment for mass casualty uh, events inside. These are for chemical uh, warfare. And the last minute or two, I will speak with you about what we're preparing in this uh, shelter, what Shari Tzedek is uh, sorry, to do now with the assistance of the Matlock uh, family is to uh, prepare an uh, emergency hospital, an underground emergency hospital uh, in the Shari Tzedek. So this is the hospital itself, and this is a huge shelter which we are preparing now as an underground hospital. I was speaking about the surge capacity of the hospital. There's no question that you can with a few hundred patients in case of uh, need, in case of chemical or any other uh, warfare. Uh, and this is the way that it has to uh, it, uh, plan that it will look like. Um, so, with pictures from Haiti and uh, from Japan. I want to thank you. Um, and uh, have time for questions. I try to rush so you have enough time. The sheriff said at one time when during like a war, the soldiers would go there first. That's still the same situation? They're injured? You would take most of the soldiers at the beginning when somebody got hurt. So again, the idea now is to triage the patients according to how many space you have in each one of the facilities. So either if you're a soldier or a civilian, they, they try to spread them around along the hospital. Charette Selek is getting more wounded people in these scenarios again because it's in the center of the time for the EMS that has to take tens or sometimes hundreds of patients out, it's much easier to come to a facility in the center of the time. The ambulance time is, is quicker. So that's the reason why we're You mentioned home. germ warfare. Are the people in Israel, do they all have gas masks at home? Yeah. Or not? They all yeah. do. Tell us about the needs of the hospital now for the underground hospital and shelter to guard against nuclear type attacks. What you're planning on doing? So, well, the slide is down, but um, the idea now in this huge shelter, which is a big area, it's an underground area, and the idea is to convert it into an underground facility that the hospital will be able to operate So this is the way it should be. This, this area now is just a large shelter with nothing inside. And what we want to try to prepare it as a hospital for the future. So you need to have uh, oxygen there. You need to have all the different facilities. You have to have a, a, the proper uh, ceiling against whatever chemical uh, warfare and uh, atomic warfare as well. This is. This is what we are planning the way that, that it's going to be. Um, so.
Let me answer it from a fundraising point of view. If you were to add all the projects connected with um, mass casualty preparedness, the capital of the building, the equipment, the training, um, we're looking at about $25 million need to, to underwrite it. Um, there's good news and bad news about fundraising and, fun and finances for both Shari Tzedek and I, to be honest, also with Hadassah. Both these hospitals are basically the two hospitals in the country that are not either owned by the government or by one of the insurance companies. They're actually private hospitals. So the bad news is they get no funding from the government for things like this. The good news is that they're allowed to go raise money for it, and they have, we both have a lot of good friends in the, in the States. You, I don't know if you watched the papers, but a couple of weeks ago, Hadassah just designated, just um, opened their brand new tower, which is state of the art and heavily funded and a wonderful facility. We are building, we are going to be completing next year our new tower, which had 30% additional floor space to the entire hospital. Huge um, eight floor facility that will get state of the art modern technology. Uh, but because we don't get government funds, everything that we do along those lines, we have to raise fund money for from donors around the world. And um, LA has been a lead. Um, in the last nine years, the Los Angeles Jewish community has donated almost $30 million to Shari Tzedek, which is not a small sum of money. Um, and the needs are going to be greater as, as more of these challenges face us. The underground hospital, $25 million. If you add all the costs of that new tower we're building, it's another $25 million, which is, you know, very significant. Um, the other good news is that we've raised probably a third, if not half, of the money needed for those two capital growth. But we look to our friends to come back and help us again to complete, especially the underground hospital. It's a top priority. Um, Oprah mentioned it was a little slow and get going, not for any philosophical reason, but it has to do with mass casualty. There was an earthquake in Israel a couple of years ago, and the government decided any new buildings, any additions, the entire building had to be retrofitted for a 7.3 earthquake. So. Not only are we building the, the new wing and the underground hospital, we get to retrofit the entire building for an earthquake, which was not a small piece of change. That the government did chip in for, but not, you know, not very seriously. So the financial challenges are very critical, very serious, and um, we'd like to ask all of our friends to help as much as they can. How deep do you have to go in your underground hospital to, to provide good protection against a nuclear blast? Well, the, the advantage of Shari Tzedek is that the first three floors are already underground because the way it's built on a hill. So this underground hospital, which is in from the second floor, is already one floor underground. So from this point, it's already it's, it's in a safe place. We'll see, show you if we can the picture. Well, uh, Jeff, <coughs> there's, there's lots of other pictures here. I didn't. Yeah. Know, this shows you. This shows you basically all the dark spot underground. The dark that they're all underground, three stories. Uh, to be honest, to answer with you, I don't think anything's going to protect anything from a major nuclear attack in the center of Jerusalem. I mean, that uh, to be honest. But I think um, if there's an attack, it may not be in the center of Jerusalem. Maybe more at the Air Force bases and the Army bases. So this is built with that in mind, but it's also built with the realism that if, if they drop a major nuclear bomb on Jerusalem, there's nothing you're going to be able to stop that. Yeah, so, uh, is this the only underground facility hospital in Israel, or is there another one there? Rambam in Haifa, Rambam in Haifa has one. Um, Ichilov in, in the center has one. Most of the hospital, that's is in the process now. Lots of hospitals in Israel are in the process of doing it. Again, it has advantages in many ways. One is, is the surge capacity. It's not only for war. But again, as I said, what happens if you bring to Cedar Sinai now, let's say 200 people because one of the building God forbid, collapses. I mean, they will not be able to, to treat 200 people within minutes. So this is a facility that you can, that you can open in any mass casualty event to treat people over there, and it's a facility that in cases of war, <coughs> that you can continue to operate the hospital from this area because it's a safe area.
but lots of, uh, most of the hospitals in Israel are in the process of uh, trying to help some If, if you Google Rambam Hospital on the ground, you'd see um, probably the largest underground hospital being built in the world. Huge, huge football field size underground hospital because of its location, I put, you know, because of where it is. Um, the government designated that. And um, the Ofer family, not your relative. No. No. Uh, you <laughs> wish they your relative. <laughs> gave, um, Even if our relative will be good enough. Right, right. 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 <laughs> gave well over $100 million to help build it. Um, but other than that, they're all, Hadassah has said, all hospitals are doing something. Shari Tzedek, because the center of Jerusalem has a greater influence because it's close to the government, the seat of the government. So it's a much more top priority for us right now to get this thing done. So the system in Israel, just in another word, I'm sorry, Rambam is a hospital that belongs to the government. So for the government, it's easy to say, okay, for Rambam, we're going to give money because it's our hospital. We own it. So it's a, we don't own it. So it's, it's, it's a different issue. So what will be the capacity of this underground hospital? And what is the capacity of your hospital in the center? So we have more or less 700 beds now. Hopefully we'll be able to put in this underground hospital a bit more than 200 uh, patients. Again, you know, in cases you need it, you can squeeze in whatever number of people that you need. You can put hundreds of people inside this uh, area. But that's more or less the number that we are preparing to. Do you have a program to teach other hospitals around the world your methods of uh, emergency preparation and control and so on? So, to be honest, we are, we are we're trying to communicate with quite a bit of hospitals, both in the States and uh, a bit in Europe. Uh, we, have, we have lots of visitors that are coming to see the way that we're preparing for mass casualty events again. From the drills to, you know, the way that we do our routine daily day work, but thinking about how to prepare if something happens every uh, minute. So, yeah, we're, all, we're, we're trying to share as much as we can. You, you're well known for your disaster work. Um, what other things do you do on a daily basis at the hospital besides handle disasters? You ask me in person what I'm doing? So, okay. I meant, the I meant the hospital. Hospital. Mean, so oh, hospital. Hospital. Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, I mean, do they have specialty, are they known for some sort of specialty besides disasters? Yeah, so, uh, well, I can go into many things. Um, I, I just named uh, just a few of them, the uh, maternity. Yeah, Paul already shows uh, so that you can read more. But the maternity uh, center in, uh, in church is, is probably the biggest in uh, the Western world we have. This year we're going to have probably over 15,000 uh, newborns in our center, which is a huge, huge number. We are, we are not only the biggest in Israel. I don't think there's any hospital in the States that has this uh, number. We have a, a large uh, genetic uh, center in uh, Sharet Sedek that is dealing with different issues, but one of them is prenatal diagnosis patients again because of the huge number of newborns that we have uh, over there. Um, from the surgical point, we have uh, new operating theaters that were opened about a year ago, um, which to be honest are state of the art. They are the best in Israel, and I traveled uh, a bit around uh, in the States, um, it's at least in the same level as the best centers of brilliant surgery, so really new and excellent uh, operating uh, theaters that we have, and uh, with really some of the best surgeons in uh, Israel that, that, that we have in our uh, center. Uh, in, in, the, in, the kids, in the kids, you'll find a center of excellence, which is a much more detailed answer to what your question is about the major center that Shari Tzedek is involved in. I would add one more to what I'm um, oh. local contact, and that's cardiology. Oh, and the uh, Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery Unit okay. um, funded for the Mount Okay, let me just say that in 1994, I was privileged to go to Israel with Steve Matlock and the entire Matlock family 